It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Welcome, welcome. It's Jill on Money. We are broadcasting live from the Capital One Bank Studios here in New York City. And it is finally spring. And we are done with April. Good riddance. It was awfully rainy. Goodbye. Mark's whacking it away. You know, uh, this is now let's celebrate May, uh, not for May Day, not for Mother's Day, but it is Mark's last month of freedom before his baby will be born. The first Jill on Money baby. He's crying, but he's excited. He had a, he had, they just went to their first class about basically how to change a diaper because I guess neither, well, Mark, don't you know how to dry, change a diaper from the nieces and nephews? No. Hmm. Okay. Well, and she's an only child, so she's got no kids that she had to, you know, this is going to be very interesting. Can't wait till Aunt Jill and Aunt Jackie swoop in. We can change diapers like nobody's business. <laughs> and I'm good at it. I was bad the first couple of times, but then it's it's very good for people who are neat and organized. Very good. If you've got a financial question or you want to wish Mark good luck, how about everybody send in their favorite parenting tips for the first month of life for Mark? Send an email. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Do that because that to me is going to be very valuable. And look how hard he's been working on our behalf. So the, the bit of advice that you give Mark for month number one of parenthood, I cannot do that because I have no children. I will just judge him for whatever he does. <laughs> All right. If you'd like to get on the program, you should also send us an email. Do that at askjill at jillonmoney.com. And that is what Sally did. She's calling from New York. Sally, welcome to the program. Sally, do you have kids? Um, I have a stepson, and he's he's uh, older. So do you know how to I change no a advice. diaper? Do you have no? Do you have any diaper changing advice? Do you have anything for Mark? What do you got? It's been so long that I don't remember. <laughs> you blocked it out. <laughs> uh, it's not a big deal. He'll get through it. I know, right? That's what I say to him. Millions of people do this, but he wants to do it best. He's very he's very goal oriented. All right, hmm. Sally, what can we do for you? Well, I wanted to ask you about some money that I have. I, I sold my mom's house after she passed away, and I paid her the debts that were left on her house and her taxes and stuff, and I ended up with about 35000 and I haven't done anything with it, and I know I should be doing something with it. Okay. It's, sitting in, it's in a savings account. It's making very, very little <clears throat> per month, and... All right, give me a little breakdown. Um, are you single or married? Married. And are you um, contributing to retirement? Are you both working? Where are you? And, like, how old are you? Give me all those things. We are in our late 40s. We both are working. We both contribute to a 401K. Um, are you maxing out your 401Ks? Uh, I'm not sure, but it's probably pretty close okay all right we're trying to, if you're in i mean you're in your late 40s you can put nineteen thousand dollars in so if you that would that would be one thing to do to just say hey i can bump up my retirement contribution and then take some of that money and savings and use that if you're not doing that but let's keep going so in addition to this savings you also have another sort of emergency reserve fund is this a surplus for you the Yes, yes, okay. it is. So we don't need that. So that's good. And uh, what about any debts? Anything out there? A car loan, mortgage? What's happening? We recently paid our mortgage. We had a home equity that we also recently paid. Like within the last year, we paid them both. Wow. And our cars are leased. So Okay. And um, nothing coming up. In, in terms of uh, needing uh, some work on your home or anything like that? Nothing big, no. Okay. And we're both handy, so we kind of do our own major. Well, not major, but we, we do our <laughs> own a lot of stuff. So. Right. You're do-it-yourselfers. Perfect. Now, 
would you feel like you want this money to be a bit safer or do you feel like, oh, I could just use this and not touch it for, let's say, 20 years? I mean, like, give me give me a sense of what you're thinking about. You want to keep it safe just in case? Maybe a little of each. Okay, fair enough. Um, where do you hold your retirement accounts or do you have any investment accounts besides your retirement accounts? No, we don't. Where's your, just the 401k. Where's your 401k and what company? Um, like fidelity or, you know, like the, the, the investment part of it, like where is the investments, where are the investments held? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I, I don't think I can answer that. Okay. No problem. Well, here's the thing to do. You get $35,000. You might say to yourself, I don't want to make this completely at risk. So one thing to do is to go and look for a longer term CD, maybe a two or three year year CD. You can find great CD rates at depositaccounts.com. All right. And then you can say, all right, well, maybe I'd put ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 into CDs. And you don't have to be so long term, but, you know, you'll get instead of getting pennies on the dollar, you'll you'll get a little bit more. You know, you probably get three percent or so. The other part of it, the at risk part, you would open up a general investment account and you can do that in lots of different places. So you can the reason I ask you could do it, say, at Fidelity or you could do it at Vanguard or you could do it at T. Rowe Price. Or you could do it at Charles Schwab. There's all sorts of places you can do this. The point that is that if you had, let's say, $20,000 to invest, you might go to one of these companies and you'd put half of that $20,000 into a stock index fund and half of it into a bond index fund and make it really simple like that. Just boom, split it up. So then, it, you know, essentially you could have, uh, you know, say $15,000 in a, a, a CD. $10,000 in a stock index fund, $10,000 in a bond index fund. And it's really simple. The question about where to do it, the only reason I asked you where your 401ks are is that it might be easier to, if you're familiar with one company's platform, it might be easier. If you're not, then you can kind of mess around and see what's out there. But again, it's very easy to go directly to one of these big mutual fund companies and Really try to just stick to a very simple approach. Some stock index, some bond index, and don't mess around with it. Don't mess around with it when the market starts moving around. And the only reason that you might change this allocation is if you really needed the money or you thought you needed the money sooner than you had anticipated. So that's it, Miss Sally. I think that you guys are in good shape. Keep saving. Go find out a little bit more about your 401ks. See if you are maxing them out, again, at $19,000 each. And then head on over to the best, I wouldn't say best, to, to any fund or investment company where you can buy cheap index funds. That's it. Very easy. Thank you for calling. And if you've got a question, send us an email, Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And if you'd like, uh, why don't you go onto the website during the break and you can buy our book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger takes the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Give us a shout. A couple ways to get in touch with us. Easiest is to send an email, ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. But maybe you're one of the people who has bookmarked our website. And that website address is jillonmoney.com. And when you go to jillonmoney.com, there will be a little part of the website that says, contact us. So easy, right? Gosh, fantastic. 
Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of fun because when we get messages from there, we also know that lots of people were, are reading stuff that we have written on the w- website or watched videos. So um, if you've got some sort of question related to that, happy to, you know, chat with you about that as well. Um, anyway, contact us button, far right-hand corner. Let's take a call. It is Linda who's on the line in New Jersey. Hello, Linda. Welcome to the program. What can I do for you? Hi, Jill. Hi. Great. Um, I just I have some questions about uh, how to invest my money. Um, so I have a significant amount in my employer 401k um, over probably over about 500000 or more. Um, I do have IRAs and other investments with uh, two other um, companies, Vanguard and Ameriprise. Um, I also own a townhouse that I rent out, so I have no mortgage on that. Mm. And um, my husband and I keep our savings separate. So, Because you're um, probably a better investor than he is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. L- yes. And my, my income was also much higher uh, mm-hmm. from from way back. So okay. I've been working now for probably over 25 years. Uh, we own our own home. We still have a mortgage on our home with a low, pretty low interest rate. Um, and uh, I also, uh, my last parent is now deceased, so I will be getting um, some money from from my mom's investment accounts as a beneficiary. So my question is... Wait, can I uh, ask you one quick question? You're still working, right? Yes. Okay, so, and how old are you? 51. How much longer do you think you're going to keep working? Um... I, you know, maybe 60, 62. Okay. Um, I don't have to work. I might be able to, to go part time or do something else. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, I'm not thinking I want to go into the, to be in the corporate world every day. Um, so I may, I may do that. Mm-hmm. And um, um, how much is the, um, so a couple things. Um, right now, you said you got more than about a half a million dollars in four hundred one ks, and you got two other IRAs. What's the value of those other two IRAs total assets? Total in both is probably um, three hundred fifty thousand. Okay, and money, any money outside of those retirement accounts, four hundred one k IRAs, anything that's not retirement that's already been invested. No, I just have some surplus money in savings and checking account. Okay, great. And um, inheritance will be about how much, would you guess? Um, well, some of that's tied up in property, so that would come at a later date. Mm-hmm. But uh, probably securities, um, I'm going to say uh, 150, 200000 Oh, wow. Okay, so a good chunk of money coming in there. And um, you say things are separate from your husband. Just wondering, so will either of you be entitled to a pension? No. Bummer. Oh, well, I thought you were going to tell me you had like this great pension fund. All right. It's all right. No, they did away with that. It got rolled into a 401k. I know. It's just uh, too bad. But I thought I'd ask anyway. (laughs) How much do you figure that you guys, and I'm going to just, I know you keep your money separately, but just in terms of planning, if you look at that, you, the two of you together, how much do you think you spend on a monthly basis? Um, well, our mortgage, is, our mortgage is high because our taxes in New Jersey are very high. We pay about 12000 a year in property tax. Mm-hmm. But what about like just like your total? Like you guys make a certain chunk of money. You save a bunch of money. What do you figure you're spending? Um, probably uh, like 4000 thousand a month for forty five hundred. Let's call it five, just for the heck of it. And you will each be entitled to social security down the line, right? Okay. Husband's assets just like again, ballpark, because if you're gonna stay together as a married couple, chances are even though you're managing your money separately, I'm just trying to get a sense of how much money you guys have together to float that five thousand dollar a month lifestyle. Right. Um his assets, again, some are tied up in property, mm. um, but I'm going to say um, 
like 300000 Okay, great. Fantastic. And I presume you're maxing out your 401k at work? Yes, and there's a 6% match. Okay, great. And you're over the age of 50, and the only benefit to being over the age of 50 is that you can do a $6,000 catch-up contribution. Otherwise, it's all downhill, and I'm with you, sister, so don't worry. I'm done telling you, though, enjoy that extra 6000 you can put in. Um, okay, so now you got a bunch of money, and, you know, I'm just looking right now, and, and, and forgetting about your husband's money, um, looking ahead, it looks to me like you have about a million dollars when the inheritance comes. And what's the question here? I mean, you're you're managing your money. What is it that you need from me to help you out with? So um, I've spoken to a couple um, uh, fund investors, uh, financial type advisors. Non, they, they're not the non fiduciary kind, but they um, a couple of them have mentioned. Uh, IUL, Index Universal Life, because my tax burden will be so high when I go to withdraw money from these different um, 401k IRAs. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is a way to um, kind of offset that tax burden. And, um, you know, I've heard some things about stay away from IUL, uh, but I don't know someone with my my situation, mm-hmm. my, uh, you know, this excess cash um, that I want to invest, is that a good option? And if so, how much should I put into it? Well, okay. So I'm not a huge fan of an EVA life insurance product. And the answer to the question is it's complicated. And before we get, before we let you go, Mark's going to give you the name of somebody in New Jersey who is a fee only financial planner who is a fiduciary who will help you give you like sort of the the yes or no. My inclination is no, and here's why. I mean, we're talking about the extra money you have, the inheritance money, and that would be what you might put into the index universal life. But you know what? I'm not so sure about that because that's not taxable income to you right now. So if you were to invest that inheritance and you were just paying basically capital gains or current income tax on those investments, it's not the worst thing in the world. But once you put it in the index universal life, A, you lose the liquidity, right? You lose the ability to have your hands on that money. Two, there are fees involved. And three, the only way to get the money out without taxation is to borrow the money out, and then you actually have to pay an interest rate. Yes, you pay it to yourself, but there's a, it's complicated. My guess is this is a little overkill. I don't think you need this. And my guess is that when you talk to somebody who is a fee-only advisor, someone who cannot collect a commission, and you talk to somebody who is a fiduciary who has to put your best interest first, my guess is that that type of advisor is going to say thumbs down on index universal life. But do me a favor, Linda, hang on the phone. Mark's going to pick it up and he's going to give you a name, uh, maybe a couple names of some folks that you might want to consider chatting with about this. Thank you for calling. And if you, like Linda, are being sold or someone is proposing a product that seems a little, I don't know, a little different than what you're used to, something that you may want to consider is to put the brakes on Put a little like time out on this and then try to figure out whether or not that is in your best interest. And you may only know that by going to somebody who is qualified to help you with that decision. So, again, that is the, the, the real warning sign, which is don't sign. Call us. Send us an email. Let us know if we can help you unravel this question. So you are listening to Jill on Money. And if you have a question just like Linda's, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back. It's Jill on Money. It is the month of May. Woohoo! May, May, May. Maggie May. If you've got a financial question, we'd like to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Okay, let's see. 
Uh, let's do these right now. This is from Alan in Virginia, who reads the column that appears in the local Newport News Daily Press. And he says, I read in here the national debt could increase by approximately another trillion dollars, due in part, I understand, to the tax cut recently enacted. However, I've never read or heard where the trillion of dollars added to the national debt during the early years of the Obama administration were expended. I remember reading about bailouts to save the financial system. I don't recall ever having a definitive idea where all the funds were going. It's not a political question, a financial one. It's why I'm asking you. The money went to a couple of different things. There was a teeny tiny piece that went to homeowners. There was a bigger piece that went to some infrastructure spending, which sort of kind of worked. It wasn't 100 percent great. Um, and um, and it wasn't it ended up being less than a trillion. The problem with the spending in this iteration is that a lot of economists are concerned that we've spent all this money and we spent it actually during a time when the economy was already doing really well, which is not when you want to start piling on debt. David writes that he's 70 years old, 78 years old. Oh my God, he's got brain cancer. Why are you sending me the sad ones, Mark? His wife is 68. And he said, I've just started to look into setting up a conservatorship so that she will be cared for after my passing. She's got memory issues. Our net worth is $3 million. About half is our home. Half is in a Vanguard account. We have an advisor who is managing our investments. He said he could do the job, but when they sent the paperwork, there was a line that said they could set themselves up as beneficiaries. I was put off by that. So I think you need to talk to a lawyer, David. I I mean, I'm sure that that Vanguard has lawyers. What I would do uh, first, and I think that given your situation for both of you, I would go to an estate attorney and I would get advice from them. Absolutely. Because otherwise, it definitely, uh, I think that, I just really think it's it, it's important to get that um, feedback. All right. Um, Nelson says they make $24,000 a year in Social Security income. They just got a $46,000 inheritance. How should we handle it? I don't know. What else is going on in your life, man? Um, maybe if you've got some debt, pay it down. Otherwise, keep it really safe. If that's all the money you have in the world, you may want to buy some CDs. You may want to keep some money in savings. Go to depositaccounts.com. You can check out where there's the uh, best savings CD checking money market rates. Blake writes, Aunt Jill, I want to know if it's better to focus on paying off the house or contributing to a 401k. Also, I have questions about staying with my current employer or moving on. My employer currently offers an ESOP, an employee stock option plan. I think I know what's best. He's maxing out his 401k. He's got some fixed annuities in the ESOP. I don't would I wouldn't pay off the house. I don't know how old you are, but you're calling me Aunt Jill, which leads me to believe that you are potentially an old 404 listener. Send me more information, Blake. I, I got to know more about you. But my inclination is no, do not be paying off that house. All right. Here's a question from someone who's retired, Bernie. He doesn't have earned income, but his wife does. So he wants to make a spousal Roth contribution based on her income. I believe you can do that, Bernie. And I think that you should be fine doing that as long as she's still working. Someone's got to have earned income. Here's a great headline that caught my eye. Uh, Dougie writes, want to retire right now. I've been with the same company for almost 35 years. I'm 54. I want to just stay home all day. My pension is getting close to a half a million dollars. I've got other assets worth 200 grand. I really don't enjoy my work and being on my feet all day long is starting to wear on me. I used to get IRS estimates of benefits mailed to me. Oh, you're not talking about IRS, social security benefits. Uh, Go to ssa.gov and get your social security benefits, but you're too young. You're 54. So what about... um, Is there something else you can do? Can we transition you into something where you're not on your feet all day? 54 is awfully young, Dougie. You're going to live a long time. We got to get you out of what you're doing and try to find you something. I don't think you're going to be able to stay home all day. I'll tell you that much. Uh, Tom is considering a job offer, wants to know how to weigh his options. The offer would result in more money up front, but 
my current job provides better long-term benefits, pension, health care. I'd love to get some thoughts about how I should be weighing my money now versus benefits in the future. You know what I think you should do, Tom? I don't know how much money you make and what your situation is. This is a great reason to hire someone who is a fee-only planner who will actually maybe by the hour work on this with you. And it could be a very helpful way for you to get some insight and how to quantify those offers. Otherwise, we'll get you on the air. I'd love to, I, I could probably do it with you, but I'd love to work it through based on other stuff going on in your uh, life. Jordan listens to the podcast. Hey, do you guys have the podcast? The podcast is uh, available on Apple, Stitcher, Radio.com, Google Play. It's called Jill on Money. Jordan says that my husband and I recently welcomed our son and we're interested in opening an investment account for him. Um, we would, along with his grandparents and great-grandparents, have some money to set aside. We're looking something that we can add to periodically and will grow more than a traditional savings account. I'm aware of 529 plans, but my knowledge is limited, and I'm not sure if that's the route. I want this money to be available to him to use in case he chooses a career path other than college. Oh, Jordan, um, you know, you can open up a general investment account, but I think you really should at least consider a 529 plan because it's just such a great deal. Are you, is your kid really not going to go to college? Seems like that's unlikely, but maybe I'm missing something. You can always open up just a plain old investment account, do it at a no uh, a no fee or a brokerage firm, or you can do it at a firm that has lots of index funds like a Vanguard or a T. Rowe Price, Fidelity. You know, those are all possibilities, but... Nothing has better enhancements from the tax point of view than a 529 plan. So uh, follow up with us. Let's get you some more information and find out what we can do to help you out. It's Jill on Money. Hey, during the break, hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com, and go buy my book, gosh darn it, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. We'll be right back. Do I invest here? Should I put my money there? Jill Schlesinger can help you. Back to Jill on Money. You're back with Jill on Money. And if you got a free minute, hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. You can sign up for our free weekly newsletter. And you should just bookmark it because we're just always putting up all sorts of neat, fun stuff. You know, we've got hits from TV. We've got some different radio shows, podcasts, got all, it's all there. So it's all cool. Check it out, jillonmoney.com, bookmark it, will you? If you'd like to get on the air with us, send an email, Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And if you don't want to come on the air, we'll try to answer your questions as best we can. That is what Marie did. Her question is about cost basis. So Marie writes, I'm 80 years old. Many years ago, I invested in Vanguard index funds, and I've got about $5 million in that account. It's about the majority of my net worth. Vanguard does not have a record of my cost basis. This was years ago before they were required to keep those records. I have been told that I will probably have to pay about a million dollars in capital gains, or I could just leave it to my son, and when I die, he can take advantage of the stepped-up cost basis. I really would like to enjoy some of this money now. How should I start to withdraw it? Do you have any thoughts? Well, I mean, look, you're entitled to enjoy it. Uh, If you could simply give us, like, a guesstimate, like if you said many years ago, how many years ago, maybe you could say that, if you just like do the best you can, come up with some recollection. I bought the these Vanguard funds in, make it up, 1981. I don't know. And then claim that as cost basis and sell some of it and pay the capital gains tax and move on. Look, the IRS cannot actually hold you to that. There is no record so you're just going to have to do the best you can. And if you and it, you really just have to try to sort of guess what year it was. Figure out and you can just go back and look at whatever the fund was that you like the S&P 500, 
1985, what was the end of the year value? Just figure out the middle point of the year and claim it as your cost basis and try to figure, you can actually probably talk to Vanguard and say, if I bought this in this year and you can figure out reinvested dividends, really you just have to do a best estimate, the best, the, the, the best you can do, right? And then uh, if you want to spend the money, spend the money, pay the capital gains tax, but do, if you can, leave a bunch of money to your kid. And yes, it's better if he could take advantage of the stepped up basis. So maybe sell some and enjoy it. You shouldn't certainly impoverish yourself if you got $5 million in an account. That's insane. But absolutely, you should be very focused on trying to use your money, make a best faith estimate, and go from there. Carl wants to know about the future of investing in the marijuana industry. Mark, what would you like to... And by the way, he, he, he says, let's roll. I love this guy. I mean... It's going to be interesting. There's tons of opportunity. I just don't know. I don't know which is going to be the surviving company. You know, there are going to be companies that fall off on the wage side. I don't know. So whatever you put into that little sliver of your portfolio, do me a favor and presume that that is money that will go to zero. It will just disappear. Uh, Sandy saw the story we did about student loans on CBS this morning, and she wrote in, what can people do when they are so far in debt in student loans, they can't buy a house, a car, or even get married, because that would tie the loan to my husband. Uh, no, it won't. It won't tie your, your loan to your husband, as long as you don't commingle all of your assets. But check this out. Here are the numbers. She took out $36,000 in the 90s. She owes 182000 now. Is there any way that, have, are these federal loans, have you checked out the different loan repayment options? That's first of all what I would do. And then I might even start thinking about, should you refinance it? That's a rough one. And then here's the same thing. Here's another one who says, same day, obviously, after the segment aired, um, 250 grand in old student loans. Make and someone who makes less than thirty thousand dollars, you totally have to figure out whether or not you qualify for any sort of restructuring of this. In some cases, in some states, if you do go bankrupt, depending on the type of loan, you actually may be able to blow it off. But that's insanity, if you don't mind me saying. Oh, brother, Wesley and his wife. Uh, basically, said that they uh, had decided to invest in a timeshare. <laughs> Major mistake on all fronts, licking our wounds. Any thoughts how to expedite this process? There are some um, some timeshares that will buy them back from you, and there are some services. You're going to get hosed on it. Let me just be clear about that. Whatever you put in, you're going to just, it, it's not going to work. You could try to donate weeks to charities. Sometimes they do that. Uh, Mark writes, he was left some money after his father died, and he says, should I put it in my 401k, a CD, or an IRA? Thanks for the advice. We've got to know more about you, Mark. Uh, you know, if if we – got to know more about your situation. Give me a follow-up. Shoot me a follow-up. Uh, Ellen is 73, no mortgage, monthly income sustains her, and she said um, – what does she want to know? Oh, she wants to know whether to have to get a reverse mortgage. There's no reason for you to get a reverse mortgage. She's going to have IRA and savings. I don't think she's going to need a reverse mortgage. She says her monthly income sustains her well. But when she starts working, not so sure. I got to hear more from Ellen also. Hey, guys, I need more information. You got to come on the show with us. We have so many follow-up questions. I'm sorry. These are not... It takes a lot of time to get to these questions. We need more info. You're listening to Jill on Money, where we crave information. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. And if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. We're just working hard, toiling away here, live from the Capital One Bank Studios. And got a really interesting question here from Fred, who loves our show. And 
and Fred is 66 years old, as is his wife. And he says, I'm still working part time. I plan to continue at least until I'm 70 years old, maybe beyond. I love this guy already. My retirement portfolio is currently at around two million dollars with my total net worth about three million. Do you think that we need long term care insurance? I'm getting varying opinions. I'm really confused about what to do. I can't find an underwriter for a regular long-term care policy, so now they're trying to get me to sign up with a life insurance policy with an LTC rider. Now, some experts say these are junk, like whole life policies. We do have some health issues, nothing really major. What do you think? Thanks, Fred. So I think, let's start with the easiest start uh, point, which is you've got a retirement portfolio that's $2 million dollars which really puts you at the, I don't need any long-term care, meaning that you could self-insure. It doesn't mean that you are off the hook 100%, but I think that you're probably okay. Um, We usually think of the cutoff at around a one and a half to $2 million of total net worth as people who can self-insure and be okay. Um, I'm not saying it would be pleasant. You'd plow through a bunch of money, but You would also have to pay a lot of fees and have a lot to contend with if you were to buy one of these other policies. Now, I'm not saying they're junk either, because I think some of these hybrid policies, which are essentially permanent insurance, like whole or universal life with some sort of long-term care rights, some of them are okay, but I just don't think you're going to need it. So I think the easiest thing to do is to say, no, thank you, keep working, build up your net worth, and relax and don't worry about it how about that okay fred thanks so much for writing if you've got a question we want to hear from you you can go to jillonmoney.com that's our website click on the contact us button and you will get what you need there's a lot of good stuff there too all right when we return more of your questions we will be right back It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. All righty, it's hour number two of Jill on Money. We are broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius is the easy way to compare and buy insurance. I read some staggering statistic. Hold on, I got to find this about uh, insurance. These always make me nuts, simply because it's just so, it's kind of scary. Um, So this is Life Happens, which is a research organization um, for the life insurance industry. And they are out with their annual survey of attitudes and understandings of insurance. You ready? Only 57% of American adults are protecting their loved ones with life insurance, with more than two-thirds who recognize the need than those who actually own it, meaning that I know I need it, but I don't have it. Oh, brother. Over half of the population thinks the cost of a term life insurance policy is over three times the actual cost. Uh, head over to Policy Genius Gang if you want to see the cost of life insurance. And term is usually, I mean, really, probably nine and a half times out of ten. You probably only need term life insurance. And if you want to get a good quote on term life insurance, go on over to Policy Genius, who is uh, very nicely sponsoring our studio. Mark, heading into high baby alert time. He's okay. He's having an anxiety attack a little bit every day. We'll let you know when uh, the newest Jill on Money family member is with us. I feel like the Jill on Money family is basically Mark and the mother of his child, me and my girlfriend, our two dogs, and now your baby. So, not bad. Seven. Not quite enough for a basketball game but we'll play a little three on three with one on the bench i got a feeling with the size of mark 
uh, and his girl, we're not going to see a big basketball player. Just saying. All right. Uh, Tennis. He wants tennis. We'll see. Uh, If you've got a financial question, hey, maybe it's about insurance, give us a holler. The email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. And uh, that's what Deborah did. Here is the question. Jill, we owned a property in California that was in the huge campfire uh, campfire fire that destroyed over 12,000 structures, and it was declared a national disaster area. That was just the worst. Ugh. Okay, here this, here's the background. The home was originally bought uh, as a rental, and then we were going to be living in it in retirement. We had good insurance. We paid it off. We received a check in the amount of $193,000 after the property was paid for. We're still going to have to pay for the removal of debris, and that could be another twenty-five to $30,000. At this time, we have no idea when we're going to receive a bill. My question is, we're not going to rebuild, and we're being told that the amount of the check we received is capital gains tax. Is it? I think that if, I think that, okay, I don't believe that you, that this is a pure capital gains. I think maybe, this is my guess, I don't know this, so you're going to have to talk to a tax preparer in the state of California. But here is what I believe. I believe that it is subject to capital gains above your basis, meaning what you paid for it. So I think what you may want to try to figure out is go back in time, get make sure you have all the numbers, right? And you look at that, you look at what you paid, you look at your improvements that you've made, right? And now we're going to see what the long-term capital gains will be. If So you're married filing jointly. So if you make between $78,751 and $488,850, so let's just do this, seventy eight to four eighty eight. If you make between that, sounds like you, that would be you guys maybe, you pay a 15% capital gain. Okay? Now. If you make less than that, if you make less than about than $78,750, your capital gains rate is zero. So you've got to figure out how much the property is worth, and then you have to go to an, attorney, uh, to an accountant who can help you figure out what is subject to capital gains. And I think that that's going to be the most important thing that you could do right now. It'll give you a tiny bit of peace of mind, hopefully. Okay. All right. Ed writes, I got out of the market just before the big drop in 2008. And I was afraid to get back in because I'm retired and cannot afford a drop like the last crash. What should I do to generate some revenue without market exposure? What about Vanguard index funds? Huh? Ed, first of all, Ed, Congratulations on getting out of the market and congratulations for missing the 300% return that we've seen since then. So now you're saying to me you want to actually do some market timing and get back into the market after it's now going up, 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 up. This seems crazy to me. So let's just do a couple of things. Ed, are you supporting yourself right now, okay, in retirement without any problem? Do you have enough income? If you do, then don't worry. Then forget it. You don't have to take any risk. If you don't and you've got some money in the, you know, that needs to grow, then you need to figure out the right allocation for you. But what you can't do is create an allocation. Then the next time the market drops, get out again. You've got to create an allocation that you can live with. And I don't know what that is for you. So I would love it if you could get back in touch with us. We'd love to get you on the air and talk about this. I think that that would be really helpful. Okay. Okay. Uh, This is from Karina um, and says, I love to hear all of your financial advice on CBS this morning. Hey, thanks. Uh, If you guys want to see any of those old segments, just go to the website, jillonmoney.com. Click on watch 
and you'll see the segments. Okay, here's a little bit about Karina. I'm 46, single, no kids, no college loans. Credit card, $3,000. I rent an apartment for $1,450 a month. Cars paid off. Just got a $5,000 raise at work. Woo! Um, and I don't, is there a number missing here, Mark? Annual income? She says 7,200. I think 72,000, don't you? Okay. Savings, 15,000. Credit towards 760. About eight years ago, the company I worked for closed. And they sent me a notice saying my pension check for the 401k was $28,000. Rolled over to a place called Park Avenue Securities. In the six years, I haven't done anything with the money. Should I roll the money to a Roth IRA? What should I do with it? By the way, I'm buying a co-op in the near future. Hey, you know what you should do? First of all, roll the money into an IRA rollover and just do it at a low-cost place, a Vanguard or Tiro Price or Schwab or TD Ameritrade, wherever you want. Do that and Give yourself a little bit of time, some index funds, that should be it, or roll it into your new company's plan. Okay, it's Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Ask Jill at jillonmoney.com. Hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com, and go buy my book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, an investment question, maybe after the tax hangover, you've got some tax questions, want to figure out how we can help you out, just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. That's Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Oh, by the way, a lot of people have been asking about the podcast because we've got this new sponsor and got a lot of publicity around it. Maybe you're listening to us on terrestrial radio, and that's fantastic. Maybe you're listening it through your radio station's website. That's fantastic, too. If you'd like slightly different stuff, not a lot different, but slightly different, check out the podcast. It's called Jill on Money, and you can get it on Apple or Stitcher or Radio.com or Google Play, anywhere else you find your favorite podcasts. And you can then go and give us a, a good review on Apple because somehow or other that helps. How are our reviews doing? Pretty well? We're good? Mark's giving me a double thumbs up. Okay. Um, Leslie writes, My mother had a revocable trust, and she put her house in that trust. Then upon her death... Last year, it became irrevocable. Let me just translate that for everybody. So revocable trust is changeable. So while you're living, you can create a trust. You can put stuff in it. You can put securities and mutual funds and a house. You can put these your asset inside the trust. Then upon your death, it becomes irrevocable, which means not changeable. And by the way, when it becomes irrevocable, it usually has its own tax ID number. Okay, so Leslie's the trustee of the trust, and she's in the middle of selling the home. The house and the assets worth under $400,000. Not really sure why we put all that in a trust, but there it is. Six beneficiaries to the trust, all siblings. Question, does each of the beneficiaries get taxed on the money as earned income on next year's taxes, or is it considered an inheritance and therefore exempt? Okay, so here's what happens. The trust has to file its own return. So you need somebody who understands how to file estate tax returns and trust returns, which is really anyone qualified to file taxes, any tax preparer or a CPA. Then what you need to do is ask the attorney who drafted the trust, what is the tax liability? Or you can also ask the CPA, but you should just ask both of them and make it easy for yourself. Here's the bigger issue that I see for everyone else, like our learning from this. Our learning is essentially that we are often putting assets in trusts and we are often creating trust for no particular reason. So let's be careful before we start visiting Joe Schmo attorney. To do that you really have to feel like this is the right decision for you okay 
Marsha is 78 years old, and she says she hasn't made enough money in the last few or three or four years to pay taxes. She did some substitute teaching, uh, but now a family farm has been sold. She has a check. Um, does she get any break in capital gains? Hey, we just went through the capital gains rate, so I don't know. It depends how much you, you actually have in income. If you are single and your income is less than $38,600, 0% capital gains. If it's 38601 all the way up to 425800 bucks, 15%. So that's, that's the deal. See if you fall in those, wherever you fall, you'll have to either pay a little bit of tax, 15%, or none. Roseanne writes, She's got twenty nine grand sitting in a rollover IRA with Fidelity. She put half of it into a Fidelity Go account, which is basically a robo or an online investing platform. Put the remainder in a CD. And the question is, will I have to pay taxes on the amounts invested? No. If it's an IRA rollover, no. You do not. Um, and you, what, as long as it stays within an IRA wrapper... You don't have to pay tax on it. You only have to pay tax on the money when it comes out of the IRA. Okay? So while it's in an IRA, go crazy. Okay? Don't worry about it. Uh, Here's another IRA question. Um, Okay. This is from Fred. I was reading that uh, the IRS does allow a spousal IRA contribution even when only one in the couple is working. My question is, what is the maximum deductible amount? Is it cumulative or can it be doubled? I don't get that question about doubled, but here's the deal. You can put $6,000 into an IRA, a traditional IRA, or a Roth IRA. And if you're over the age of 50, you can put in an extra $1,000 for a total of $7,000. 7000 total for each if you're over the age of 50 and 6000 for each of you if you're under the age of 60. And Fred, that is only for a calendar year. So it's each of you get that. Okay. Uh, Charles listens to us on, w- on uh, WHAS in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh And so he is 51 years old and has been contributing to a 401k for the past six years. I have about $40,000 in there now. We have recently been given the option by my employer to change all or some of our contributions to a Roth. Smart move for me or should I keep contributing to the traditional one that I've been using for the past six years? I plan to work for another 15 to 16 years. I don't know how much you make, Charles. So that is really what we would want to know. If you are in a low tax bracket, we might think that the Roth could be good for you. What would a low tax rate be for you? Uh, I, I mean, look, do you make less? And I don't know if you're married or not, but if you're single and you make, say, less than 39000 bucks, yeah, maybe you do a Roth. It really depends on what your tax bracket is. Um, And maybe you split the difference. Maybe you can say, I'll start doing Roth now, and I'll keep the other stuff where it is. I like having some money that's already been taxed. That is good. But let us know how much you make. It will help us guide you a little bit better. Lena wants to say that she enjoys uh, the advice here, and she says it's genuine. See, that would sound so much better if somebody said that on the air and then we could play it in an endless loop when we get the nasty grams from the disgruntleds. Okay. Lena's husband and she have a mortgage as well as a second. The second um, was used to um, redo the home and we took it out 13 years ago. The interest on the second mortgage is something like 9%. My husband has spoken to a bunch of financial institutions. Nobody seems to be able to help us. Is there a way we can lower interest on the second? We just don't get it. Um, Hey, Lena, I think you're going to have to, maybe you don't refinance the second. Maybe you got to refinance the whole thing. I need the numbers to help really guide you on this, but maybe the way to do this is 
to essentially allow yourselves the opportunity to refinance all the debt that's out there, okay? And then you might get a lower rate. You might be able to pay it off more efficiently. But we need the numbers, unfortunately. So that's a problem. And last, right before we go to the break, Joyce is writing that she's got investments uh, in mutual funds. They pay well. They've got dividends, long-term capital gains. My husband and I are retired. Our other income is from government pensions and Social Security. While I'm able to receive a tax refund, we're hit with an increased um, deduction from their Social Security income. It's based on AGI. Any ideas on how we should adjust our investments? Yeah, yeah. Get out of those dividend-producing accounts. Just get out of them. Move it into more of the uh, sort of an index fund environment and stop selling stuff with uh, big long-term capital gains. Um, Index funds really do work well for this, so you might want to check that out. Okay, uh, but be careful that you don't incur more taxes in changing things around. So there. Uh, Okay, when we come back, more of your questions. It's Jill on Money. Check it out, jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now back to the show. You're back with Jill on Money. We've got this new studio. And uh, does it sound different to you? Not to me. But anyway, hopefully it will improve our quality. We are always seeking to improve our quality. Um, but we don't we don't go crazy about it, though. We don't. We didn't, like, jump up and down and say, oh, we want a new studio. They came to us. The fine folks here at the CBS Radio News Division, or CBS News Radio Division. Anyway, if you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address, askjill at jillonmoney.com. Askjill at jillonmoney.com. And uh, that is with what, let's change this name because I think they want a different name. So let's call her Wanda. I don't know why, but I just said Wanda. That's good. Um. Wanda writes, I am surprised by the amount of retired military that email you and ask how they're doing. Wanda says, my husband retired from the Navy after 32 years, and that was back in 2012. He he currently has two jobs, not one, two. One is a full-time job, lots of travel. His other job isn't even really a part-time job. It pays more than my own full-time job. I call it his fun job. Now, Wanda herself is a government employee, and she said, basically, we always kind of banked my salary uh, because we never knew where we were going to go next. Um, Anyway, Wanda says, I'm the saver in the family, and I love watching our savings and investments grow, but I'm also the one that believes we could retire at any time. My husband isn't convinced. I've had two friends whose spouses recently died in their 50s. I think if we're in a, in really good shape, we should retire earlier. That is true. Although, you know, it is part of my book, The Dumb Thing Smart People Do With Their Money. Dumb thing number eight, you spend too much money early in your retirement. That can definitely be something. That's a trap. So let's see what Wanda and her husband have. They've got a net worth of $2.2 million. They have an emergency reserve fund of eighty grand. they have got 401ks, IRAs um, of about, let's call it, 800000 Okay? And they have brokerage accounts of about one3 So there's your $2.2 million. All right? They've got 10 acres of land. All right. Now, let's, let's talk about his the the what what the husband has he makes 130 grand on his full-time job and his part-time job is 70 and she makes 60 then he also has a military retirement of 73 grand 
So they spend about $13,000 a month currently. And uh, they've got a, a mortgage on their home. Um, they don't plan on staying the, in the house. They're going to probably downsize and probably have a smaller mortgage, maybe none at all. All right. Now, here's the thing. She uses a robo-advisor personal capital. And um, she used to have, she used to pay them about a uh, thousand bucks a month. Then she's like, nah, I could do it myself. So she she's using a, a, a different advice, a different robo and just doing different stuff themselves. And she says when they, she runs the numbers and different folks run the numbers, they're basically like 99% set for retirement at age 60. And what she really wants to do, I guess, is to understand how to possibly convince her husband that they are set for retirement. The answer is, yeah, you are probably set for retirement and probably at age 60. But I think if you show your husband the numbers and he still doesn't believe the numbers, then that is simply an irrational response. And so what do we need to do to get him over that that threshold? And maybe it's you saying to him, look, I really want to stop working when I'm 60. And if you don't want to stop working, could we at least agree that you would give up the job that has tons of travel? Because even if he just had that part-time job, plus his military pension, um, then that gives you about 140 grand a year. You can spend some of the money in your brokerage account to supplement it, and you can wait to draw your Social Security, and then you'll be all set. Just saying. I think you're set, but something else is going on here. Um, uh, sidebar, Wanda wants to know if I, are, if I am familiar with Tasty Trade, which I totally am not. Mark, you know him? And Mark looked it up. There's a lot going on. Um, And so here's the other part of Wanda's question. I heard one guest on your podcast say he quit trading options due to a large loss. I recently, due to my son's influence, became interested in trading options, but keep it small. So, okay. Tasty Trade's philosophy is trade small, trade often. My philosophy is do not trade often at all because... There, every trade, every transaction has some sort of cost. And, you know, if you want to just play around with options, my first job on Wall Street, I was an options trader. It's fun. It's a mathematical equation. It's great. But honest to God, um, don't you have better things to do with your time? I I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't see this as the smartest thing to do. Um, and it probably is begging for a little bit of um, trouble down the line. But you know what? If you want to do it, fine. Totally fine. But I would try to be careful. Please. Really. All right. Um, our one minute to go. <sighs> All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait to do this one. I got a, some college loan questions that came in after we did a bunch of stuff about college. Last question here. Let me just give this from uh, Ruth Ann, who's uh, 64 years old. And she says that um, I have invested in my, 40, my 401k and a pension. And advi- an advisor told me to put 50% of my assets in an index annuity. The rest managed by the financial advisor. Fees are 1.5%. Um, is 1.5% reasonable? Uh, you don't have any dollar amount there. So I don't know. Um and I'm, you probably don't have an advisor if someone told you to put half of your money in an index annuity. Send me more details, Ruth Ann. You're listening to Jill on Money. And coming up, we're going to get back to more of your great questions. During the break, go to JillOnMoney.com and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money, where Jill Schlesinger helps you take the mystery out of your finances. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, give us a holler. Holler! Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Give us a lot of 
details. Let us know what you're thinking. I've been doing a lot of speaking engagements to support the book. And so I'm going to answer some of the questions that I've been getting as follow-ups. I was out in the Bay Area and, uh, boy, there I feel so bad for these people because the housing market there is insane. Even though it's said to be cooling down a little bit, God, it is hard to buy. There's just not a ton of inventory. Um, and so here is somebody who followed up. Um, let's just call this person AB. Got it, Mark? AB. So AB is worried that in the future, buying a home feels really out of reach. And so she said, you know, I'm not sure that this has to be the sign of financial wealth. And she said, I'm glad that you reiterated that it is not the case that it's okay to rent and not just buy. All right. So when the question is about um, investing in index funds once you pay off your debt and hit and uh, fund your emergency reserve funds and max out 401k, AB says, I've got all those points covered. I currently invest with Vanguard. My question is, with the money I'm saving monthly, should all of it go into a mutual fund? Should I put some of it into savings, even though I can cover 12 months of living expenses? I don't think so. I think you can put, you know, you don't have to invest it as aggressively as you would invest a 401k, but I think that you could certainly just say split it with a bond index, a stock index, maybe an international stock index, um, and and don't necessarily have to put, you know, overdo it with your emergency reserve fund. Second question, uh, for 401k, AB is maxing it out. She contributes uh, 7% to a Roth 401k, 5% traditional. She's sort of on the border of a tax bracket. Um, so is a doing a mix going to be more trouble than it's worth? Nah, I don't think so. It's fine. And here's another question. Um, should I put my money... Uh, it, it, also for the 401k, if the economy were to go into a recession and say stocks tank, but I could still max out my 401k, should I? Yes, of course. You. That's when you absolutely should be. That's when you should be putting the most money to work, you know, if you had that opportunity. So here's the other question. I know there is not really a way to fully catch up when it comes to missed years or opportunities, but after paying up $45,000 in student loans, I feel behind um, most of the people my age. AB is a ripe old 28 years old, okay? I have years worth of savings. It'll be my first time I can max out my 401k. Um, I don't have any anything else. What's your advice, suggestion for next steps on building financial wealth and freedom? I think that really you're doing exactly what you should be doing. At age 28, you're maxing out your retirement account, which is fantastic. And you're going to be putting some money in a non-retirement account, which is fantastic. And that's what you need to do. You don't need to be buying individual stocks. You don't have to be uh, trying to figure out the best time to buy or sell. Stick to the game plan, okay? Stick to the game plan. And I think you'll be happy for doing so. All right? Good. Thank you for uh, hanging out with me in the Bay Area. It was a lot of fun. All right. Um... Okay, more questions. I see Mr. Mark. He's handing, he's put, got his fingers in my face here. Um, okay. Question here is about, uh, about college tuition. Uh, my daughter will be starting college in September, and I'm a widow, and I live on just my own salary. I have a son starting college in three and a half years. Uh, I'm nervous wreck on how I can afford to co-sign loans for both. Any information you can provide? Okay, how about this? Do not co-sign on loans. Do not. What you need to be doing is having a conversation with your kids so that you can basically say to them, I can't help you. I got my own issues that I have to manage. Okay? Oh, brother. Um, here's one last question before we close out this segment. This is from Mark, who ha wants to tell a story. He says, I'm currently in the middle of your book, Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money. I was on the chapter about identity theft, specifically the story you told about wiring money and how a financial advisor would never send wiring information through an email. That very day that I was reading the chapter, literally, I received an email from my financial advisor person saying Charles Schwab was having some problems 
uh, was having some processing issues and I would be best served time wise to wire money to them instead of waiting for the checks to clear. I didn't send the money. However, I might have had I not read your book. When I contacted my financial person, he let me know their system had been hacked. How about that? The hacker was posing as my own financial advisor and the hacker um, and ultimately my financial person stated that it was not likely this would have succeeded. But we are all very grateful that I did what I did. I just wanted to say thanks. I am enjoying your book tremendously. Thanks for writing it, Mark. That is so awesome. I know these stories are crazy because you simply cannot like you can't trust anyone. And the best possible position to take is the position that don't do anything. That's the do no harm approach. Okay. And if you were to to take that approach, you probably save yourself quite a bit of anxiety over the long term. Be skeptical. Don't just click on things. Don't just wire money. Do these kinds of things. Really be careful. Okay. You're listening to Jill on Money. And if you've got a question, we want to hear from you. Hey, maybe your kid needs some help with college stuff. Maybe you're sending your uh, your freshman high schooler out on college tours. You may want to check out moneymentor.com. Check that out. That's going to be helpful for you. Okay, we'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. Before we close out the show, I uh, just want to get to some college financial aid questions and some comments. So um, this is really interesting because I did a few segments on CVS this morning in March and then again in April. And um, this is a note from Bernard who says that um, has the idea of presenting – or combining college fees and loan interest as the real cost of the degrees has the idea of, of like looking at it all together help in deciding what major that the kid pursues or postgraduate program to enter. He says a little guidance to the applicant for figuring the total interest cost may be useful too. Yeah, I mean this is one of the hugest problems that when you look at these financial awards and kids sign up for loans or even families. Those first decisions are made without understanding what the long-term cost of the loan is. And that's a problem. Okay. Um, Here's a note from Fred, who also saw the segment about student loans. And uh, he's in a huge mess. He owes over $200,000 in um, student loans. But he's really gone through a horrible phase. Uh, Divorce, foreclosure, process of bankruptcy. Um, I contacted my senator, never got to speak with him. Aid said they'd look into it. Um, So I also was interested in this because, you know, we often hear that you cannot discharge uh, a student loan via Chapter 7 or Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, But there is some there are some circumstances under which you can discharge student loans if you can prove undue hardship. So. I think you might really need to think about whether or not you fall into this. It's not impossible. That's what I guess is really important, but it may take some work. They're really the, – the, the test has three prongs. You have to prove that you cannot maintain a minimal standard of living for yourself and your dependents based on your current income and expenses. Two, the second prong, your financial situation is not likely to change during the loan's term. And three, you've made good faith efforts to repay the loan. All right, that's it. That's the show. We have been broadcasting live from the Policy Genius Studios. Policy Genius, the easy way to compare and buy insurance. If you've got a financial question, send us a note. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Hop onto our website, JillOnMoney.com. You can listen to past shows and you can buy the book, The Dumb Things Smart People Do With Their Money, 13 Ways to Right Your Financial Wrongs. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.